Uh, um, all right, it's the privilege of mine to introduce the next uh, for our, our speaker for tonight, uh, Mr. Daniel Yoon, um, is the CEO of the Belsar Group, which manages $1.5 billion. Uh, it's a private investment firm, and prior to that, he was a uh, managing partner at Voyager Advisors, and he's also held senior positions at Goldman Sachs and some company called Lehman Brothers. Um, he is a graduate of West Point, uh, in which after he served as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and he's also a graduate of University of Oklahoma and getting his master in public administration. Without further ado, Mr. Dan O'Neill. Thank you, Dr. Lee and, and, and friends. And uh, I think it was mentioned earlier. Is that, is that okay? It was mentioned earlier. I, I was actually coming here for another meeting and uh, I was asking Dr. Lee actually today, that, uh, well actually I got this list that you guys were all coming about a week ago, so I got a while, and I asked Dr. Lee on my way over to his house because my plane was delayed by six hours, so I was on the plane for 12 hours. Um, I think some of you guys heard there was a big sto uh, storm um, out on the East Coast where we had 60 miles per hour gusts. But anyway, on my way over, um, I asked Dr. Lee what I should talk about, and he said, oh, just be yourself and talk about the same thing. So. I just want to talk um, about 20, I think I have about an hour or so. Okay. 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, 20 minutes or so. I'll talk about my life. Um, I was born in Korea. Um, I left Korea when I was, uh, in 1973. Uh, I was six years old. And um, I had a normal childhood. Well, we lived outside of Philly. Um, uh, I would say middle class, very middle class upbringing. My father was an artist and uh, my mom was a nurse. And I had a normal childhood except um, my father and I, we, we went fishing a lot. Um, uh, we, we, we had a van that we would go fishing every weekend, pretty much, where we would spend the night there and then come back Sunday morning and then go to church on Sunday. And the other thing that I really liked um, growing up, I, I don't know why, but I really, really liked Kung Fu movies. Um, and um, I just love the whole idea of, just the whole idea of, going up to the mountains and training for four years or three years and then coming back down to help community. It just, it really resonated with me. And I loved the movie Star Wars when it came out. And the whole story of Luke Skywalker, uh, I watched all of it many, many times. And I still enjoy watching Star Wars today. So my junior year, I went up to West Point. And when I went up there, I said, this is, this is my school. It was, it was Sparta. It was exactly what I was looking for. I would go up to West Point, train for four years, learn a lot of stuff, and then come back and be a learned person. And West Point to me was, it was like Sparta. It was like the Kung Fu movies that I used to watch, the Shaolin monks, and you would go and train for four years. So my senior year after graduation, um, West Point starts early summer. Um, we were driving up from Philadelphia to West Point, and you go towards George Washington Bridge, and then you go up Palisades, and right as we're reaching George Washington Bridge, um, my father, who, I, I used to spend a lot of time with my father fishing, and he, we, we rarely spoke, um, uh, and he said to me, he says, Tongjun, Tongjuna, uh, Tongjun is my Korean name, and, and he said, you know, my mom, your mom and I, we sacrificed everything so, so we could, you could have this opportunity to go to West Point. And we wanted to be, and I remember this, and it was so nice, we wanted, a, we wanted to be the small airport to, to see you take off. And we can't tell you how happy we are with this small airport. And, and I remember that, and I cherished that. When I got to West Point, I viewed it as a nine-year course. Um, four years of academics, five years of military training. And just like the Kung Fu movies, I just loved training. I just really did. And I signed up for, I was, at, uh, I was an exchange cadet with Sandhurst. That's the British Military Academy. Um, I, was, I went to air assault school during college. Uh, that's repelling school. And I went to Germany for my summers. And after graduation, I went to um, paratrooper school, which is airborne school, once again training. And I went to ranger school after that, which is the um, commando school. And then I, I did my service in Seoul. I was a company commander. And while in Seoul, um, they have a, a, a program, because a lot of people ask me, why do you have a, 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 you know, a 
UC Oklahoma degree. They have a degree at night that you can get it. Um, so I never actually stepped foot in the University of Oklahoma. I've never been there. I, I, stepped, I, I mean, I get literature and mail. They're, they're, they have a football team called the Sooners, uh, who I've never seen. But apparently they're very good. So after about five years, my, I felt my training was complete. And I wanted new challenges. So um, I applied to business school. I wanted to go back to New York City. Um, West Point is very close to New York City, so I used to go down there a lot. And I, uh, on my way to Columbia Business School, I left the Army around May of 1993. So I had some time before uh, business school was going to start. As soon as I got to New York, I went to a West Point Society meeting, and there's uh, a lot of West Point Society chapters that are going out here in LA and so forth. And Ted Halligan was the, was the president of the society, and I went to a meeting and we started talking and he said, you know, Dan, I'd like to have lunch with you. And I said, well, of course, you know, Ted Halligan is a much older gentleman now, seven years old, very wise. And we had lunch and he said, at the end of lunch, he said, Dan, you need to do three things. And I said, oh, okay, well, what are these three things? He said, you need to be part of the New Society. You need to join a club just to work out and, be, and socialize and you need a good job. And for the first part, he asked me, he said, oh, by the way, next week you're going to come here and meet me over here at this event. And I went there, and it was this, his wife was a president of the Republicans Committee of New York. Um, this guy by the name of um, Rudolph Giuliani was running. He said, look, I think this guy's going to make it. He said, I want you to sit down and sit next to him. And so I went to like three or four of these um, very expensive dinners. I don't know who paid for me. I think it was Ted. And I ended up becoming a commissioner of protocol for Mayor Giuliani. It was, it was kind of a, a thank you for Mayor Giuliani. For the community one, he said, Dan, I want you to show up at the New York Athletic Club. The Athletic Club for non-residents of New York at that time, it's kind of a prestigious club where you need like six people to sign you up to join. And uh, he, I used to box at West Point and he goes, Dan, he, he said, meet me at the New York Athletic Club. He goes, John, Bob, Mike, Dan's going to box. Right? He goes, yes. And he goes, you're going to write the recommendation I'd write. So I was boxing there shortly thereafter. And he said, you should go work at a place like Goldman Sachs. That's a good place to work. Although he didn't give me the job, I, 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 he may have, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, um, I applied to Goldman Sachs. Uh, I got a job. And at Goldman, once again, my whole concept was training. training. I, I don't know why, I just love training. And I said, you know, I'm going to take 10 years to master this business. And um, it took me about five. Uh, and I felt comfortable to leave on my own. So this was 1993. I postponed my business school. I was like, well, I go to business school and uh, you already got a job at Goldman. And in 1998, I started my first hedge fund called Voyager. And I left in July of 1998. And this, it was an exciting time for me to go off on my own. And, uh, and I had some sponsors, and I had raised some money, and I was going to put my own money into the fund. And at that time, I didn't even really, I mean, people didn't really know what a hedge fund was. It was just a vehicle that you could charge fees, and, and, uh, and you're supposed to do some cool things with it. But as soon as I was about to start, Long-term capital, I don't know if you guys remember, long-term capital blew up. Long-term capital uh, almost was bailed out by the uh, federal government, by uh, Robert Rubin. So that was like two weeks after I, I opened my hedge fund. So all my investors, they didn't come in. Hedge fund was a very bad word. So I was here, I'm going on, going on on my own. And I had very little capital, but I, I opened uh, my business. And for six months, things didn't go very well. A lot of my trades went the wrong way. and. In 19, so one year later, things were difficult, and I got margin call by Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley said, you know, you gotta come up with 200,000. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of money by today's standards, but for a guy who had all his money in the fund to come up with another 200,000, it, it was kind of difficult. So I emptied out my credit cards, I had like four or five, and I had $100,000 in the bank account that was kind of my rainy day fund. And I, and, and I, got, I also got married the year before. So my wife um, was at, and, and I overdrew on my account. And my wife went to the grocery store that day. Uh, 
And she said, you know, Dan, the, uh, uh, is everything okay? My, our debit card's not working. And I said, oh, uh, I said, don't worry about it. It's, uh, I'll buy the groceries tonight. And she goes, is everything okay? I said, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, she knew it wasn't okay. Because I had pulled out all the money. She had to, how embarrassing for my wife to put all the groceries back. And I've had many of these trials, and this is probably one of maybe seven or eight, the most difficult thing when my father passed away. And nothing really compares to that, but uh, about six years ago. And each trial was harder. But then it's weird. They get harder, but then they get easier in a weird way. So the market turned by 2000. Uh, everything was going well. The stock market was up quite a bit in 2000. And uh, we were managing over a billion dollars, which uh, you know, we were successful. Um, by the end of 2000, uh, 2001 or so, we were managing about a billion dollars. But something felt wrong. And although I was successful, I, 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 uh, I got to the top of my little mountain. Um, I looked down and there was nothing but the other. The, everything was down from here. The, so I decided with my wife, we, uh, I said, let's go to Hawaii. Let's, let's, uh, so we took 10 days, she went to Hawaii. And I stayed longer. We, we, we stayed, spent 10 days in, uh, on the big island. And then I stayed back a little bit longer. Because I wanted to go marlin fishing because I love fishing. And so after my wife left, uh, I stayed in, um, in uh, Waikiki and we would go out. I would, I would charter a boat by myself, like this 55, 60 foot boat, and I would go out. And we would just go back and forth, back and forth, and it's beautiful. It's like blue water, blue skies. And I'm sitting in this big chair in the back by myself. And so the first day we didn't catch anything. The second day I go out. You know, you start meditating, you start thinking. And I said, who am I? And why did I go to West Point? I went to West Point for X. I'm, I want to make money. Why do you want to make money? If you keep asking questions, it's amazing. You, you really can find out who you are. And after doing this for a day, the third, the fourth day, I remember something that happened in my life that I didn't remember for like 20 plus years. And I was just, um, sitting on the back of the boat, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I imagine time just going by. I, I can just, I'm literally so focused. And I remember an event that happened. I was five years old, just before coming to America. And we used to bring money in to pay for school. And I don't know what it was, channel or mom, whatever it was. And we brought the money in, and then we went outside to play. And then we came back, and the teacher said, the money's gone. One of you guys took the money. And, and the teacher made us hold books above our heads. And I, I went, oh, everyone was crying. You know, we're five, six, or seven years old. And so a couple hours into it, I raised my hand. I, I, I stole the money, teacher. I'm really sorry. I'll get the money back. And so everyone left. And I, I don't really remember what exactly happened after that. You know, I know my grandmother came to pick me up. And I remember just being yelled at, and uh, everyone laughing in my little village. And the next day, I remember no one was talking to me, and I remember everyone laughing at me. And then, and then during school, the morning, this kid next to me, I guess he felt so bad for me, he said, don't you didn't steal the money, this, this fat kid did. <laughs> I don't know why they're always fat kids, but this little fat kid did. And, and he had the money with him. But I remember that day, I was more pissed off that day because the teacher held me back again, and, I, and this time, she said, she held me back because, <laughs> why did you save yourself the money when you did it? And, the, the, and I remember this on the boat, on the back of the boat. That night, I went to my friend's, uh, my friend was living there, he was a doctor. He's, um, I went to his uh, house. And he gave me a book called, a uh, book by Joseph Campbell. It's called The Hero's Journey. And because I had talked to him about Star Wars and stuff. And on the cover of it was uh, Luke Skywalker. You know, it's like a picture. If you ever see the book, it's a picture. Luke Skywalker, but it was called The Hero's Journey. And what Hero's Journey was, it's this guy, Joseph Campbell. Some of you guys may know him. There was a big series done by Bill Moyers on, on, on PBS, like a 12 series. Uh, he passed away 10 years ago, but he was the greatest mythologist. And what he did was he studied all the cultures throughout all the different years, centuries. And he specialized in like going to the Aborigines of Australia to to Africa, to um, South America. 
And what he discovered, he had an aha moment, and this is like his pinnacle work. What he discovered that all these cultures that never talked to each other through periods of time, they all had, they all had myths, they all had stories, and they all shared the same story. And he called it the hero's journey. And basically the journey went something like this. A person gets called, the gods call them, tap you and say, okay, you're, you know, you're it, you're chosen. And then secondly, you, 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 people help you along the way, of course. And the second stage, you, you, you get some great insight into something. And then you take that insight. The third and final phase is you come back and you help community. And if you don't finish the third phase, gosh, it's, it's awful, you can become Hitler as the worst example, but, and you see this in, 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 um, in the Western culture, you have uh, Moses, Moses, you have a guy who couldn't even speak well, but he brought 10 commandments, and uh, in the Eastern culture, you have Buddha, you have the eight, Eightfold Path. And if you really want to make a blockbuster movie, you just follow this movie. In fact, George Lucas based his entire, really his career, on the story. He consulted with Joseph Campbell to make his Star Wars series. And it's, it's the same, and the, George, Luke Skywalker, average Joe, gets called. He finally accepts. Yoda helps him along the way. Goes to this special place where he gets all this training. He becomes a Jedi, and he comes back and he saves the Empire. You have the same thing with Lord of the Rings. You have Frodo, average Joe, gets called. He's the only one who can very boring, and then he saves community. You know, the same thing with Matrix, you have the same thing with Harry Potter. These stories are blockbusters because there's something in these stories that resonate with us. So as I conclude here, you know, I believe we're all on a hero's journey. And that's what Joseph Campbell says, every single one of us. But a lot of us don't know it. We just we have to accept the call. All of us, gods are calling us all the time. And when you do accept the call, wonderful things happen. And they're not fun things. It's a lot of pain. But in the pain, you'll grow so much. And just as for me, extraordinary people will come out of nowhere. Ted Halligan, for me, I don't know this guy. He comes out. And there are so many stories like that in my life. I'm sure there's some in your life as well. And this journey, if you're making a movie, yes, you gotta go somewhere where exotic. New Zealand, I think, is where they film a little bit of rings. But what I found out is this journey is really inward. I thought it was external, it's not. But it's really inward. And as you go inside more and more, it's an incredible journey. And I think that's where wonderful things can happen. So that's my little story. That's that's my life. And so I'd love to open up for any questions. There's so many more parts of credit conventions. <laughs> it's hard to get a 40 year old, well, I'm 43, 43 year old's life into in the 15, 20, 15 minutes, I think it was. Um, I actually fished for like five more times. And one of the things I got out of that trip was I went back the second time. I started reading Joseph Campbell, actually, that book after he gave it to me. But I went out after that. And then my final aha moment after asking all the questions was, Oh my gosh, all my life, here I am, trying to chase this freaking mile, spending, I was like 800 bucks, you know, between two captain names and stuff. And, and I wasn't looking around at the sky, and I said, oh my gosh, it's not about catching the marlin, it's about the journey. And so my very last day, and this is a true story, was I, the captain said, uh, we didn't catch any fish, what would you like to do? I said, you know what, let's just pull all the rods in. And there was a beautiful sunset, and we sailed. So actually away from the sunset, which I got to see from the back. And that's really the rest of that story. So after you came back to the States? <laughs> well, after I came back to the States, I would say it's, 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 none of this stuff, what, what, none of this stuff happened over, I mean, in my story, they may seem like they happened overnight. It wasn't like that at all. 
I think biblically it's right. Things are like, you know, it's like Proverbs, wisdom. It's left foot, right foot. It's one step, you know, it's, 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 like, uh, it's like yeast. It's, it's like trees. It's like mustard seed. It, it just starts really small and just grows, little by little. So there's, there is no immediate pizzazz all of a sudden. But once you start asking the question and you start growing, you look back after a year, after two, after four. And for me, I've gone through now eight, eight trials by five. Um, in each one, I think just as hard as the first one, but you just get better and better. And you don't even realize it. So that's what happened. You just get wiser. Oh, I just call them dry. I mean, event, event. Life changing events or whatever. They're not really, yeah, they're kind of like, for me, there are events where I can't sleep for weeks. If, if, if there's an event that causes me where I can't sleep for weeks, literally, um, I remember one, my wife's a physician and I asked her to per, 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 percocet once. I mean, this is bad, I shouldn't tell you guys this. <laughs> As I couldn't sleep. I mean, I literally, I was so, I mean, the, the problem was so great, not great, but it was such a big problem. And and what's amazing is when you go through these problems, you come out of it. It's 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 kind of like if you want to build a if you want to become a warrior, if you want to become a warrior, you can't become a warrior by playing video games. You, you really have to experience it. And just at the point of that, and what I find that if you do take the journey, and I think a lot of you guys have already taken the journey, the gods are wonderful actually. They they actually it's like pinpoint accuracy. They make you suffer just enough until you say mercy. And then this trap door opens, and poof, everything's like blue skies again. And then it happens over and over again. But each time, you just get better and better, and you become a deeper person. Um, I, I have a friend who is 70, 65, this is my he, 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 he didn't, he, he shunned troubles. He didn't want to, he always took it. And he's older, but you know, I speak to him, and there's just not a lot of depth. There's not a lot of character there. So I think troubles are good. The problem, as we get older, you, you, problem, when you were 10, you, you had problems. They seem, you know, whatever. Let's say you were 15, and your boy, boyfriend had broken up. And that was like life threatening to you. But as you get older, your problems become bigger. But your ability to handle them get much better, i.e., your character gets deeper. And you really find out that they're not really, they're not really problems. They were there to help you. Um, Frodo, I mean, Lord of the Rings, Frodo, for example. I mean, if, if, if yeah, because I love that, I love that the, the trilogy. Every single like other scene, they're in some kind of trouble, right? I mean, the spider comes in, or they like, you know, chasing some ghost in some mountain, and they're always on the knife edge, and then they come out of it and they, they get better and better. And, and, and I think I know that's a movie, but I think there's some truth in that movie. And if you become, and if you go through these troubles, um, you come out of it. You always come out of it, and you just you just become a person with deeper character, I think, and that's what I mean. So it, it becomes the problems they don't consume you anymore. Sorry, it, uh, well, it, you know, Ned Cal part of the word the name is uh, network in Ned Cal, and the hero's journey though is a lot of times you know, especially the movies that you say is this lone person having to go all under all these uh, trials and tribulations. But you talk about the role of the mentor and then coming back to the community. How do you see that relationship with others in um, this hero's journey and the purpose of that? No, I think that's, I, I think there's a role for both. Um, obviously, hero's journey is not the general theory that encompasses all theories of relativity. There, there is no one such thing. But if you look at the hero's journey, almost all heroes throughout life, it's usually it's not a club that creates something. It's not like this clique or this club, whatever. It's usually one superhero individual. I, I, think, I think the gods, they imbue one individual. And that's what you see throughout life, whether it's Moses, Jesus, or Muhammad, or so forth. Um, but I, having said that, that's a, the hero's journey. I think, I mean, I don't know, I haven't read any books on the community journey, but I'm sure there's one for the community, that there's huge benefits of uh, 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 like a net cow organization and the benefits of that. 
But I think for me, Ned Cal is, is a uh, is an oyster bed. It's it's a fertile ground to uh, bring people together and to create heroes. But I, I believe that the world is changed by individuals who, be, who take on heroic feats. I believe organizations are just made up of these individual heroes. That kind of answer your question. I'm the graduates of uh, West Point. Uh, uh, how many persons did you uh, graduate go to the private sector, or how many persons did you use uh, to the main in the I'll give you general numbers because it changes. Uh, when I joined West Point, uh, our numbers were a little different, and I think the newer number, there's actually someone else here from West Point that's uh, um, uh, four years after me. Well, when I joined West Point, we had an enemy. We had an arch enemy called the Soviet Union. But, but by the, that's, how, that's how we got there. We're like, yeah, we're going to fight these guys. By the time we graduated, the Berlin Wall came down. It's like, it's like we didn't have any more enemies. And we're just like, what do we do, you know? And so it was quite different. So for our class, 70% um, got out uh, because of that. I think that was part of the reason, as well as the Army was downsizing, because it had built up so much because of the Cold War. Um, I think the classes after me, I think the numbers are a little more, maybe more like 50 gets out, 50% gets out, 50 stays in, but half and half. But over, about 20, over 20 years, probably after 20 years, only probably 10% stays in, because, you, because you, you get half your pay. And it doesn't make sense to work for, you're essentially working for half pay after 20 years if you don't leave. So unless you're on track to become generals, and unless there are lots of wars, it's, it's hard to get become a general. I mean, you just don't need that many generals. Um, so the percentages will vary depending on class, era, and what's happening in the situation. The, as far as going to the private sector, probably not that many. Into finance, I don't know why. Finance is probably a few percentage points. Uh, law is probably higher. Because I think it, there's an easier path to law. You finish your, you finish your service, you go to law school. Uh, I think business, even if you go to business school, the path is less clear. And also making the transition from the military to civilian life, it's, it, it, it's not that easy. I don't know why. It's, uh, simulating back is not that easy. <laughs> I, I remember when I joined Goldman Sachs, uh, one of the partners at Goldman said, um, Dan, I like you. So I'm going to give you a bit of advice. And he goes, you know, whenever people say, you know, Dan, you're, 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 you're a smart guy, but all that stuff before the but, it, don't listen to that. That's what you're listening to there. All the, all the stuff after the but is what they're really saying. I said, oh. Because to me, it's, you know, they, they both got equal weight, right? The point one that came first, you get higher weight. And so there's a lot of subtle things. And out of the military, everything's over, right? You wear a rank. You, know, you, you do what you say. Wall Street is like, it's like, it's like you do this and you're doing something else over here. Um, so, and, and, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's not that easy to, uh, to do. So I think it's a small percentage goes into the professional private sector. So I would say less than 10%. Yeah. Um, you're in, having a tour in Korea from the military service. Did you experience any you know, being a Korean American was pretty unique, you know, saying, serving in Korea as a Korean American. I was in Seoul, so I, I, I had it easy. I got very lucky. I was in Seoul. Um, I, I kind of, I had a good time. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, they had some exchange, they had some like program where they like, uh, we had this, uh, uh, you can get German cars without paying duty tax. So I had like the only BMW 325 back in 1990. Which is like, so, and I played golf all the time because we had a golf, we had a really good golf course in Songnam that was like $250 a, a, a year membership. So I, I had, and, uh, but anyway, so I had a different experience. I mean, I still did my job, I don't you guys think that I, I just goofed off, but uh, I had a different experience. <laughs>
and then often people learn from that mistake. So what do you think has been your biggest mistake when you've been making money? My biggest mistake was I was so focused on training and learning and stuff that when my father passed away in 2004, even though I took some time off to be with him, after he died, I, was, I actually went into mild depression. When my father passed away, all my life, even though that lesson about, you know, Martin, and it's about the sunset, to me, it was still about getting there. It wasn't about living. And so my biggest mistake is that I, I didn't taste it. I didn't taste the food. Like, I, I, would, I wouldn't chew the food. I would just swallow the food. I mean, you got to taste life. Um, and it, it, it took an event like when my father passed away where I couldn't taste him anymore. I couldn't deal with him. But I realized that that's probably my biggest mistake. But I, I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's, life is about learning. And I think that it took a lesson like that for me to learn to savor life. Life really is a flower. It is a rose. If you try to capture it, but rose, I think, I never understood why people make flowers, right? I mean, it goes down and it's, it's, there's no function to it, right? From a back to back, right? There's no function to it. It dies in a week. You gotta throw it out. And good flowers are very expensive. But the flower is wonderful. You, know, you enjoy it for what it is. You don't try to capture it, take it home. You know, and you just enjoy it. And that's life. And I think that's the lesson that, uh, unfortunately, I had to learn kind of late. And uh, it took something like my father passing away. Does that mean? But all the other lessons, losing money. Uh, at the time, it sucked, but it sucked. Like, uh, <laughs> you lose people. And uh, the, 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 at that time, my priorities slipped. I thought it would, and, and let me finish the second part of that. I, I came up with a new priority, and it really helped my life for me. And you know, it was always some function of God, family, and work. You know, friends and family kind of being included. And it's after my father died after that, that I said no. My priorities were actually backwards. It was work, family, God, or work, God, family, whatever. It's God, family, work, and it's in that priority now. And if you get that priority right, everything else falls into place. If you get that priority wrong, it may work for a little bit, but over time, it's not going to work. And that's probably that was a great lesson. It's actually the right way to think about work. I think most people on Wall Street have it wrong, and it's going to play out over time. You can be right, what's that saying, like book and clock is right twice a day. You can be right for a short period of time, a long period. What you just said is actually the right answer. Um, here, let me give you my comments on that. It's actually, you actually asked the harder question. The um, strategic thinking, which is long-term thinking, is the right way of thinking. Strategic thinking is sort of getting the fundamentals right and then having a strategic, having a vision and applying towards that. If you look at some of the most successful people on Wall Street, Warren Buffett, um, uh, like Kravis, and you know, even Mike Milken, I know he, he went to jail, but you guys were, these guys were very strategic thinkers that taught long term. Other guys were doing transactions because they want to make money today. They may make money for the next five years, whatever, but as the last crisis taught us, Two years ago, they're, 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 they, just blow, they just blow around in the wind. They're like shaft in the wind. And so you don't recognize everything takes time. So for me, everything is long term. Even for me, like I, I, people are like, Dan, why don't you grow? I said, I don't want to grow. I said, I can only make two shoes a day. You know, I don't want to make 10. Well, at some point, if I get there, I'll make it. But I just want to do what I do. And if you're good, if you do what you do and you're good at it, over time, you will get found out. People will come to you. Kings and queens will buy your shoes. So for me, I'm taking a much strategic view that I just want to do what I do, and I'm going to do it well, and not worry about all, all this other stuff. So I think it's the right view to have the right priorities, right long-term priorities. I think the short-term priority is greedy. I don't think that works. I think it works for time being until it doesn't work. And it would be kind of. These are not black and white answers, but you'll see, you'll see, um, think about 
the, the, the guys who are really successful in Wall Street, you know, all these strategic thinkers who you won't hear about for like 10 years, 20 years, almost a year. Well, how do you do that? It's because little by little, they were building, they were building, they were building that foot, right foot, doing the same thing every day, day in, day out. And then, you know, and that's really the, the, the key to investing is, 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 uh, is compounding. People don't know that. It's not to lose your money. Warren Buffett has a, has a great saying. Uh, the first rule of investing is never to lose money. The second rule is never to forget the first rule. And that's it. And if I can tell you, it took me five years to learn that. I'm telling you guys in five seconds. Because what happens is if you don't lose your money, you, it compounds. And it's amazing. At year 20, the compounding, you start making bills. Warren Buffett made almost all of his money in the last five, 10 years. For the first 30 years, it was just compounding like this. You hardly notice it. And then, but now, it's like, gosh, you know, on 50 billion, you make 10%. Wow. Right? That's 5 billion. You know? That's the power of compounding. And so, and I think life is like that too. You want life to compound. There are no short term ways to get there. And so, for me, I'm thinking of all growth. And I hope that I'll stay in business for a long, long time. You can ask me not this and not that. <laughs> Friendship, like you just go like, wow, kindred brothers, like when I was when I was eleventh grade, I found other Korean kids my age, and it's like, whoa, this is, this is the coolest thing, and it's too much, so I was like, I had to pull back. So you go through different phases because the gossip started, right? The, uh, uh, I, I I've never thought about what it means to be a Korean American as a separate thing. I just think I don't think it matters if it's Korean American. It's like kind of asking yourself, it's like, okay. What do you think about being a guy versus a girl? I mean, we are what we are. But as I get older, I'm happy for everything I have. And I'm even grateful for the things I don't have. But I'm extremely grateful for the things I do have. But I'm, I'll tell you one thing that I'm really, really happy about being a current American. And I think a lot of you guys are like me, one and a half generation. I, I was reading a book um, uh, on the airplane a long time ago. And I was, I, I, you know, I like these books you can skim about great, great leaders and, and, this, and about people that changed history. And every single one of them, they had one thing in common. They were all immigrants. They, they were all, it's like the story of, of the hero's journey. The hero was in a village, left the village, and then learned something, and they came back and helped the village. It is, it is not possible to stay in your own village and then solve the problems of the village. You need perspective. So as a Korean American that was born in Korea, to come here, to see who I am from the outside, go back to Korea, see who I am, I think that is something that we have such an advantage over a non-Korean American versus someone who's American who's just brought up in America and just stayed in America. That vision of seeing us outside is, you will see Korean Americans do extraordinary things called that, I believe. Every single person over the last one hour that won Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, that changed the course of history, had left their little village, looked at it, you know, just like the hero's journey. And so from that, so I, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to say I'm proud to be a Of course I am. But I'm proud to be a guy, too, right? I mean, it's like I was born this way. Um, I don't really think about it as a separate thing. But I just think of the advantages that I have in Korean American. And I think, for me at least, they far outweigh. We have nice skin. As I get older, I touch other people, guys' skin or what girls' skin. I just say, what is skin? It's like, you suck their rock, you know? We, you know? And, and girls, women, my wife looks great for 41, right? I mean, Korean girls are like the most attractive girls that, you know, past 35, right? I mean, so I'm just being frank. So I just look for the advantages, right? and, 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 and there are a lot.
I was, I was, I was one of four. I was the last one. By the time they got to me, they were just tired. <laughs> with my brother, it was, and it didn't work with my brother. I mean, he's not doing that well. Um, and, and, and I think, it's not that my father was wrong, I think every child was different. If we were flipped, and my dad put that kind of pressure, I think I would have excelled. My brother folded under that kind of pressure. Um, so, just like West Point, I was an artist. I was like this art, artistic guy, I still am, or at least I like to think so. So the West Point, all that, it was, a, it was the right way, the way my father and my parents raised me, was very, by the way, they were just so tired, they like, yeah, do whatever you want to do. You know, be creative, whatever. And that was, it was the right path for me at the time. So for me, the answer is, no, I didn't have any pressure from my parents. You know? But my brother, boy, it was just like, it was, it was like a submarine that was 10,000 feet below the sea. And he packed in that pressure. So I, I think it's individualistic. It's just completely out of curiosity, but what was Ranger School like? It sucked. <laughs> it, it, but you know what? I, I, I recommend this. I recommend this. I recommend you guys. I, I, I play mind games all the time. And uh, with myself. Uh, and uh, first I got to Ranger School. I was like, I'm a prisoner of war. That's how I make it. So we got, uh, we got one meal that day. I was like, wow, I can't believe they're feeding me. So the guy next to me is like, damn, this sucks. I, they're only feeding us one meal. I was like, what do you mean? They didn't have to feed us. They don't have to do shit. It's like, they, 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 they're feeding us. And the next day we slept an hour. I was like, we slept an hour. And he thought I was a little crazy, but I, was, I took it as like, look, this, they, we volunteered. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, kitty can. This is supposed to be training. And if you go in with a mentality that everything you get, you're grateful and it's a gift, your perspective completely changes. So for me, yes, it sucked. I mean, it was, it was awful. I lost like 30 pounds. I didn't get any sleep. But I learned something. I learned a lot about myself. And uh, so it wasn't that bad. Yeah. You know, I, you know, my life story, I, I guess I'm trying to mix in sort of a lot of stuff and kind of let you guys figure it out. I don't want to kind of tell you what this is for what I'm missing. At five year old, when I was on the back of that boat, it, 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 I believe it's not that God called me, but I think that was my first call. Of course, I, I, I kind of accepted it, but I didn't do it knowingly. But the other part of that story that I didn't tell you is I did not afraid. As I remember, I was like, was I a five-year-old, you know? Teachers like yelling at me, you know? I was not, I, I always felt protected. So even from a very, very early age, and even today, I just feel like there's just, you know, you know I, I just feel protected. And that's, that has really, really helped me. And when you look at life, and you really examine it, I mean, really live and examine life, you'll find that wonderful things that have happened that shouldn't have happened. Even the bad things. And well, some of us say, well, psychologically, well, you know, Dan, you're just playing mind games. No, it's not. It, it's, it's, to me, it's beyond the probability of doubt. It's, I'm so certain that certain things have happened because it just, it's just it's impossible. It's impossible to me. And so faith has played an important part. I think the scary, I think hell is if God said, look, I, I, the world is on, you're on your own. I think it'll be. I, don't, I think it'll be random. I think it'll be chaos. I think you know people will, will be savages. I, you know, that's what I think. And so I think uh, religion plays an important part in my life. And I think the gods are a lot more involved within us and in us and in community than we think. That's just my personal belief. But, um, I feel like these are like cones that answers. I, I'm, but uh, you know, these, these they aren't black and white answers. For they're, 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 they're based on one's belief and one's experience. But, um, I mean, to, I, I was at a campfire um, this past week. We have a place up in the country, up in the Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock was a thing. It really didn't happen there, but they called it Woodstock. 
And we were talking, we had like, you know, we, uh, we drink scotch outside, but it was cold. And, uh, and, and someone asked me a question, and, and, and you know, what's the most important thing to you? For me, I just want to, uh, you know, I think the purpose of my life, our life, is, is union with God. If, if that's perfect, everything else is perfect. If that's not perfect, nothing else is going to be perfect. And, um, and that gives me incredible joy and strength. And, and it, it's, just, it's just there. I can feel nothing else. I almost wanted to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> no, <don't say> <laughs> yeah. On Sunday, you can do that. <laughs> no, but I, I think it's important. I, I, I have a hard time personally, uh, conversing with atheists or, or someone just, I, I just, for me it's just so real in my life, and I, you know, I think it's a gift I was kind of born this way, and uh, you know, uh, I'm thankful for my parents and my friends. Sideways, but that's 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 the economy. That's de it depends on so many exogenous factors. You know, if, if Sarah Palin becomes president, the world may be very different. The next presidential race, for example, who knows, right? So those are exogenous factors. But so I just try to think about the things that I can control. And I think for most of us, it will be okay. The economy will be okay. And as far as inflation, deflation, old, I, I I've been an inflation. I've been buying trees. Um, I took out all my fixed mortgages a uh, long time ago. I can't wait. For it. It's going to be awful when inflation hits, but when inflation hits, I'm going to be paying back my mortgage in inflation, inflated dollars. And I took all the money from my mortgage and I bought um, I, I bought Timberland. Timberland is a great hedge to inflation. I bought that about three years ago. It's not that I was so wise and I thought there was going to be all this inflation. I was just worried. I just saw commodity prices three years ago. Copper. Uh, gasoline just three years ago, even before, I just saw commodity prices uh, rising. And to make paper currency is inherently weak. So you don't want to hold a piece of paper because they can print more of these. And this is the conversation I had with my portfolio manager and other people. So I said, let's buy, let's buy gold. Let's buy, let's buy an inflation hedge. But the problem with gold is it doesn't grow it and, and, and it costs money to store it. So our second best alternative is let's buy trees, hardwood trees. So we bought acreage up house, driving my wife crazy with like in Saratoga. It's like, well, why are we here? So we're buying timber land. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we bought these trees uh, uh, 
large acres of land uh, for about four hundred fifty dollars an acre. The timber value is worth four fifty. In the last three years, uh, it's done really well because trees grow. It's fantastic tree, unlike old tree grows, and they're worth more when they grow. So, so that's what I'm, that's what we do. that's what I remember my personal name. So you're saying you should buy a farm? <laughs> I'm saying it's not. It's uh, you know what I would personally do. I would you know if you have fixed mortgages, definitely fix them. If you have homes or something, definitely fix get fixed mortgages and take that money and buy um, you know income producing assets. Uh, if you have some extra money, buy a one bedroom. Uh, things aren't going to get much cheaper for one bedrooms, and then rent it out because when inflation hits, your rent will go up and also your building will go up, and you'll be paying back your interest. If it's five hundred dollars today, when inflation hits, that five hundred dollars will feel like three hundred dollars. So that's what I would say for the. Yeah. So what about the community economy? Given that it's on the whole, a lot of reminders I, I think that, you know, the, the, the reason that was bad was there was human capital, there was civilian casualties. We've had that axe murder where more people got killed. There were other work, but they were all military. This is the old first time that civilians got killed, so it was like, whoa, civilians, you know, that could be me, right? A, a civilian could say, that could be me. Uh, but in terms of, I, I think it's going to be fine. They, they, they have no choice. What are they going to do? do it, if they do it again, we're going to nuke them. I mean, they're not that crazy. No, I mean, they, they're not suicidal crazy, where if they do something crazy, we'll just send them to troops. Um, so I think that'll just blow over, that your first part of the question. Your second part of the question, so what I think of Korea, I'm very optimistic on the Korean economy, because I'm not, I, you, you always bet on people, the resilience of the people, and just, I look at Korea, if you look at the U.S. economy, um, I look at three things that are really bellwethers, um, high tech. Uh, entertainment industry, which this is a big part of, and high finance, finance, Wall Street. Those three things are make up a big portion of our uh, GDP, and they're very hard to do. It takes a lot of innovation, creativity to make great movies, entertainment, high finance, and uh, high tech. Korea, amazingly, if you look at Korea, those three areas, it's it's that's actually pretty damn good. High tech, it's pretty good. Entertainment, it's nascent, but boy, from nothing. You know, there's like 70% market share in Malaysia of like these, of these uh, uh, soap operas. It's a myth, out, out of nowhere, right? And Korea's producing Wonder Girls, and these girls who have written one hundred, top 100 chart. So, yes. Yes, it's not Hollywood. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have the size of Bollywood, but it's a very creative culture. And finance. You know, I, I'm there, I know that, uh, I go to Korea, I think Korea's catching up and learning very, very quickly. Learning very quickly. I'm very impressed on the financial side. We're ranked at number 25, Seoul is a financial city, but I, I think it'll move up very quickly. Um, and, and that tells me, in other words, so when you see a person learn three new skills very quickly, let's say Korea was one person, Korea Inc. was one guy, and you see someone, like, wow, this guy's doing it quick. You know, you're, it's, it's impressive. You know, this guy's smart. This guy will. So I'm optimistic on Korea. And on that note, that's a great. Uh, thank you for your financial advice. <laughs> thank you for your life <laughs> advice. Yes. Um, going to the end of the year, we all these are great presents. Uh, thank you for your presence. So, um, and to everyone else, we hope we'll see maybe if. Even if uh, Daniel is not here in LA, we hope to see more things and see you more often as well. It was wonderful to have everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.